Welcome to the Lighter Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and apparently Gal Gadot can suck it. Uh, yes. <laughs> also here, John Schnapp. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> I'm loving the spirit today. Also here, Mark Ellis. Ch -ch -ch Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers. Ch -ch -ch Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers. You look like the Chip and Dale's after about 20 years of not getting a lot of work Boom. and Th falling into an alcohol problem. This is the ultimate realization of the character Dale. He was always the drunk uncle of the rodent community, and finally he gets his comeuppance here on Movie Mark Talk. Ellis is the cutest of all three of us up here right now. All right, I, I, need, I need to start off this show with a poll. I need to start off the show with the poll <laughs> all of you watch this live or even if you're watching this uh, afterwards chime in on this so let's get the wide shot of the table here yeah who is the better looking halloween table today this table over here and we don't have a wide shot but let's show both cameras or that table over we there we got uh, look at look at us we go. got duo wonder woman going on over there <laughs> I, I think it. clearly yeah. this is the better table I don't know, beyond I would a shadow I would of a rather doubt look at the wonder woman uh, that's what i would rather look at. Uh, it, that's it, only they, because they you're looking through a mask no it's, I, they're, they're better costumes ours are kind of chimpy look we all know that female <laughs> chipmunks ah, love reproducing yeah. da, da, da. if they're looking on this I, I think that if you're a if you're a woodland creature this is the table for you <laughs> Yeah. Or if you love clowns who like to play Tetris, this is the table. <laughs> yeah, that's such a great mashup costume, a clown who loves Tetris. All right, guys, let's get started <laughs> right. with the first topic of the day. In an interview with EW, Doctor Strange director Scott Derrickson revealed that James Gunn shot four cameos for Stan Lee for four upcoming Marvel feature releases. Collider reported a few months back that Lee had flown down to Atlanta to film the set, and now we know who was behind the lens. Speaking all about it, Derrickson said... James shot four cameos with Stan in one day and was texting me the frame. Does this look great? Does this look good? John, thoughts on James Gunn directing four Stanley cameos for future Marvel films? Well, I mean, there's two parts of the story here. Part number one is that James Gunn is the one. I'm sorry for the lisp today. It's, uh, James, Gunn, James Gunn is the one doing the directing of all these Stan, Stan Lee cameos. I think that's great. Him and him and uh, and Stanley get along great. He's a good guy. He's got James Gunn has a great sense of fun and a great feel for fun and energy, and that's what you want from these Stanley cameos. The other part of this story is a little bit morbid. Part of the reason, well, no, not part of the reason. The reason you do this is because Stanley is 93 years old, mm. and not just you're not going to worry. You're worrying that he's not going to make it to the next movie, but you know, for a 93 year old guy, and look, when you see Stan at conventions or whatever. We just saw him at the Doctor Strange premiere, mm -hmm. right? He is spry yeah, yeah. and he has energy and he's great. But for a 93 year old guy, going to set is, whether you're 93 or not, is a test of endurance. It's a lot of stand around and wait, move over here and wait, do this and wait. And as, as that doesn't sound like it's physically exhausting, but at the end of the day, you're exhausted. And they kind of figured, you know what? Instead of getting Stan out, like on four different days to come to set. Let's get them out on one day, knock them all out of the park, and then use them in future movies. Overall, it's just a smart move, even though it sounds a little bit morbid. It's just the right thing to do. I don't know, Schnepp, what do you think about this whole thing? I like it. I mean, I kind of wish they shot 10 of them so that we have like Stan Lee banked for like the next 10 <laughs> Marvel movies. But it's cool that they got the next four. I was just trying to guess which four those are. We know one of them is Doctor Strange. The second one has got to be Guardians of the Galaxy. And what are the other ones? The two Avengers movies? or Probably, Avengers, yeah, well, at least one Avengers. Or Black and, Panther. And Black Panther. Or Thor Marvel. Ragnarok. I, I Spider-Man Homecoming. I don't know how he pops into Thor Ragnarok. I mean, that's it's going to be pretty tough right? to just have Stan Lee be like the UPS guy on Asgard. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, they, they had him in Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. They, they, they certainly did, but Guardians of the Galaxy just felt like more of a fun tone to me. So I think Thor Ragnarok is the toughest one to wedge him into. But as somebody whose species tends to survive about four years, I think is how long <laughs> Chipmunks last, that it's great that he's made it 93 years. It's exciting to have him in more cameos, but it does at least to me indicate that they do have somewhat of a story mapped out for what they're going to do in Infinity War and maybe even the second movie in that series because 
Unlike you, I, I felt like the Doctor Strange cameo, it, it did, you didn't need to know where that movie was going. I don't think you could have just shot the Doctor Strange cameo and then been like, oh, let's just, we'll throw that in anywhere. I think that it did need to have the story guided a little bit. I disagree, because I think if you look at, and it's, we're, we're going to be getting dangerously close to spoiler territory, but we'll see, when you see the movie, um, Stan Lee is doing something and then something else is going on in the background. And I think you could have taken that and almost put it in, in anything, mm -hmm. almost, with the yeah. same kind of scene, maybe. And that's the beauty of the Stan Lee, my still, my favorite Stan Lee cameo to date. The Deadpool cameo. Yeah, that was the best That one. was my absolute favorite one. It was funny, it was great, and to see him doing, you know, he's a strip club DJ, that was awesome. What's I, your favorite Stan Lee cameo? Uh, I gotta say, because uh, when he played Willie Lumpkin in the Fantastic Four, even though the movie wasn't good, that was like the perfect mm -hmm. role for him. And like him as the male carrier, like Mr. Stank, you know, like, I would like to see, hopefully they did him as another mail service, delivery service guy. So that would work. I would go with uh, Hugh Hefner. I, I love his cameo in the first Iron Man movie. Robert Downey Jr. running by him saying, what's up, Hef, or whatever he says. It's a, <laughs> that's the best one to me. Actually, my favorite, though, is uh, I think it was Spider-Man, the amazing Spider-Man, where the lizard and him are fighting in oh, the in library. Oh, in the library. Yeah, that was a great one. On, and it's just almost like all you hear is the music, and you see the fighting mm, in the yeah. background. That was my Wendy, favorite. what about you? What has been your favorite Stanley cameo so far? Schnepp took my favorite, which is the one that when they were fighting in the library, he's got the headphones on, not even paying attention. <laughs> I took a favorite. <laughs> what about you, Ashley? Your favorite Stanley I cameo? Was, I think you said my favorite one, the Deadpool one. Like I just, I mean, I love the movie as a whole, but seeing him in there cracked me up even more. No, I can't remember the exact line. You can't buy love, but you can rent it for three minutes. I, <laughs> and only Stanley can say it. Right. All right, what's next? <clears throat> According to a report from Deadline, Tom Hardy is attached to play American gangster Al Capone and Fonzo, a new project written and to be directed by Josh Trank. The film is currently in pre-production and will center on the later years of Capone after a decade of imprisonment where dementia is rotting his mind. No release date has been set. Schnepp, what do you think about Tom Hardy playing Al Capone for director Josh Trank? Um, I like it. I like the idea that he's doing a smaller, more independent film with a great actor. I think it's the it's a, a really good move for him to do that to return to filmmaking and uh, and not get too bogged down with uh, you know politics. What do you think? I uh, think this is the right call. And uh, shout out to Christian Harloff, who actually called this last week on Movie Talk. We were talking about Josh Trank and what his next project should be. And he suggested a smaller film that might be a mob style movie. That's exactly what we're getting. And I do like the, the, the change of pace that we would get from his last film, The Fantastic Four, which we all know about the myriad problems on that movie. Mm -hmm. So this one, I love the star power involved. So if you were going to sell me in a Tom Hardy movie that's a gangster film anyway, I'm in. The fact that Josh Trank is doing it, I think he's got the right story storytelling capability to pull this off well. Yeah, I'm happy about this for all the things you guys have already mentioned. Number one, Tom Hardy playing Capone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's gonna be great. A Capone story about the final days, the, fi the final era, if you will, of his life in those final moments, in those final days. I think that's fascinating. And I love that Josh Trank is getting another kick at the can because what he did in Chronicle was really, really special. Because I, and I know a lot of you guys, were all completely tired of the found footage formula. Mm -hmm. I was done with it and yeah, I yeah. wasn't even, I didn't even want to go see Chronicle. Yeah, me neither. And I did, and the way he was able to tell that story was beautiful. Now look, the Fantastic Four thing, it's fair to say that there were mistakes made on both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, Josh Trank himself will tell you that, hey, he did some things he shouldn't have done and, and how he responded to it, that the infamous tweet, for example. But at the same time, he did kind of get screwed. At the mm -hmm. same time, like the, the way, the, the amount of interference, and I'm the one who says, Fans complain way too much about studio interference. They complain way too much about it. But that was one of those situations where it was just really egregious. So there were mistakes made on both sides. I'm glad that that didn't, you know, send Josh to director purgatory right. for the next 10 years. I'm glad he's going to be able to get back up. Now, he's got to make this one work because you got a great story with a great lead actor. There's no excuse not to make this work. I think he will make it work, and we're going to see Josh Trank do a lot of really good stuff in the future. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by AMC Theaters. Boo! A Medea Halloween took the number one spot for a second week in a row, pulling in $16.7 million and bringing its domestic total to $52 million. Sony's Inferno, the third film in the Robert Langdon series, fell $10 million shy of expectations, pulling in $15 million 
battling for a number two finish. Jack Reacher Never Go Back took the number three spot in its second weekend, delivering 9.6 million with a domestic total of 39.7. The accountant took the number four spot with 8.5 million, bringing its domestic total to 61.3 million. And rounding out the top five was Ouija Origin of Evil, pulling in 7.1 million for a domestic total of 24.6 million. Mark, thoughts on the weekend box office? I'm actually happy about it, Ashley, because it shows that word of mouth means something and that just because you put a huge star on a poster doesn't necessarily mean that the movie is going to be number one at the box office. I love Tom Hanks. Huge fan of Felicity Jones. I'm a big fan of Ron Howard directing movies. It did not work in Inferno for me. It felt like just a tired retread of what we already seen in these Dan Brown novel turned movies already. So the fact that something like Boo can come out, it's Halloween weekend. People want to celebrate Halloween. I understand why it's number one. And Inferno, do a better job and maybe you would have been at number one. Here's the funny thing about Inferno. I completely agree. I was, I thought Inferno was the best of the three Da Vinci Code movies, but that ain't saying much because I, I really do not like the first two Da Vinci mm -hmm. Code movies at all. And I thought it was a very odd decision to go ahead and make this third one. I didn't think there was much public interest there for it. And sure enough, there's not. It makes $15 million. A movie starring Tom Hanks, directed by Ron Howard, based mm -hmm. on a best-selling book, makes $15 million. But here's the funny thing about it, too. It has made $132 million internationally. Combined, it has made $147 million Ooh, already. Wow. With only $15 million in the domestic market. This movie's almost broken even already. Right. And like, so on the surface, it looks like an incredible failure, but it's literally made 10 times as much money in the international market. That is an incredibly rare thing. Why it's happened with this movie? Tom Hanks probably is the thing and it's built off international best-selling book, but it's a really interesting thing to take a look at. Also pretty excited to see that, not excited, but it's interesting to see that Jack Reacher, um, it, it fell like almost 60%, which mm -hmm. is not surprising because it's not a great movie. The Accountant only dropped another 37% which is great, so I'm happy to see. It still has not made as much money as that movie deserves to make, but it's nice to seeing it plug along. Anyway, what uh, stands out to you about this week's box office? Um, well, for me, uh, Boo being the number one again in a second second week, and that's just, that's a franchise killer for Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. It's yeah. A, that's a wrap. They're like, look, we, we're, we're barely gonna get our money back. We're done, you know? I think they waited way too long. The first movie came out, what was it, 2003? Second movie came out in 2006, and then what? Now we're in 10 years later? That's why I think it's like people just forgot about it. I don't think they waited too long. I don't think they should have done it at all. Well, yeah. I it mean, did feel like, like like Satan had a contract with Ron Howard and Tom <laughs> Hanks, and he's like, hey, you guys got to give me my three movies. Because I understand why you make the Da Vinci Code and even Angels and Demons, but they're just there was never like the critical reaction to those movies the same way there was to the books Agreed. that everybody loved reading. So I don't know why you make the movie, but it, it would, I guess if you were going to open Inferno, you did it on the right weekend. It just didn't pan out, at least here in the States. Very interested to hear those international numbers, though, because that's what we see more and more is studios catering to an international box office which is the right play i mean look if your if your movie's gonna make money anywhere then that's why you make the movie just because it didn't work well here in the states doesn't mean it didn't work for everybody else i, I think uh, i was gonna say i think it's 2006 then 2009 but still they mm -hmm. waited too long I, I still i cannot think of a movie off the top of my head that has that much disparity like a big hollywood movie that has that much disparity between its domestic box office mm -hmm. Versus its international, like I, I can't think of a movie. I mean, that has Warcraft. That much. Warcraft shocked me. With Warcraft how well was it did a big one. Yeah, that one did really well Plus, too. Plus, people should never underestimate Medea again. I think a lot of people are like, <laughs> never underestimate should, Tyler Perry, that, man. Yeah, put that in. 4, has there been a Medea Christmas? I think there's been a Medea Christmas. I don't know about a Medea Easter or a Fourth of July, but I think you could start seeing Medea celebrate more holidays. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you Definitely. right now. I, 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 this is if, if you're listening, Tyler. Here's your next gold idea: Medea Super Bowl. I'm telling you right now, okay. that movie makes bank. All right, we've reached <laughs> that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table will simply say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? According to THR, New Image slash Millennium Films is plotting a reboot to Rambo, the classic 1980s action franchise that starred Sylvester Stallone. Brooks McLaren will write the script with Ariel Roman directing. Titled Rambo New Blood, the reboot will not see Stallone return as he did in Millennium's 2008 outing. Instead, a younger actor will be recast in the role with Millennium Films looking at the character as similar to James Bond. There is no word on a release date. John Byersell, the rebooted Rambo franchise, 
guys with new blood. I actually really buy this because that first movie, First Blood, is so good. And it's so different from all the other Rambo films. I think this is one you can reboot. And I know that the Rambo franchise has become synonymous with Sylvester Stallone. I dig that. I understand that. But I think it can go through metamorphosis. I think it can change. You know, the original one came out like 1985. And it's a brilliant, thoughtful movie mm -hmm. and exciting at the same time. With the rest of the Rambo films, they just went full full on blown. Let's get into the 80s action and the 90s stuff. And it became synonymous with the genre, and that's awesome. But I do think they can redo this. For me, it's a buy. What do you think, Mark? It's a sell for me because of what you just said, is that it's synonymous, the name Rambo, with this over-the-top machoism action movies, which are fine and good, but you don't want to reboot that. If you are going to reboot it, you do want to do like what you said with the original story, which had a lot of intricate layers to it, and there's a lot of emotional depth there. But that's not what people are going to think when they see that a new Rambo movie is is coming it's just going to look like when they tried to reboot Conan the Barbarian or something like that I just don't think this is going to work because I don't trust the studio to handle the property right it seems like they just want to make another action cash grab movie as opposed to explore any any you know sort of deep pathos that is involved with somebody who is coming back from Vietnam or whatever war they set it in yeah, I unfortunately have to sell it. I would have bought it if it wasn't Millennium Studios handling it, mm -hmm. but I just feel mm -hmm. like even with their like, we've got our own uh, James Bond here, they're already mishandling it even before they even start making a script or something. So unfortunately, like for me, First Blood, you're right, is an incredible film. I'm gonna keep, you know, I'll watch that again. All right, what's next? Collider's own Steve Weintraub recently spoke with director Doug Lyman in anticipation of his scripted supernatural VR series Invisible when the conversation turned to an update on Edge of Tomorrow 2. Both Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt are signed to return with Lyman saying, that is the only sequel that I'm considering doing, and it's because, first of all, the story is so amazing, much better than the original film, and I loved and loved the original film. And second of all, it's a sequel that's a prequel. Mark, buy or sell an Edge of Tomorrow 2 with a sequel that's a prequel. Now, this is a buy, Ashley, because of what Doug Lyman said. It's a sequel that's a prequel, and with the way that they had fun with the time-space continuum in Edge of Tomorrow, that's what I want to see. I don't just want to see the next day and then live the rest of their lives. I want to see, okay, we finished that time time loop so now where do we go from here what other adventure can we have with Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt in a world where something like this is possible and there's alien threats that are looming left and right I love this idea and I think a lot of people out there would be totally on board for anything more in the Edge of Tomorrow universe I buy it I just hope they change the title and don't call it Edge of Tomorrow they should go back to all you need is kill anything <laughs> other than that live die repeat any of the don't use that title don't do a repeat on that or a prequel on that. Just do All You Need Is Kill. But yeah, I buy this 100%. I love that movie. I buy it too. Unfortunately, while I totally agree with you in spirit, you can't get away from the title now uh. because that's what the, the audience knows it as. They totally should have gone with All You Need Is Kill as the original title because Edge of Tomorrow sounds like a, a midday soap opera. It's a romance It's the novel. wrong <laughs> title, but it's too late now. They've done it. So uh. you'd have to call Edge of Tomorrow All You Need Is Kill is what they would have to do. Uh. And I don't know which is worse at right. that point. What do you call it? What do you? If it's a prequel, is it is it is it the Beyond Yesterday? What, like, but it's a sequel that's a prequel. I, so yeah. a pre-beat. What is it? A pre it? It makes sense in this because part of it is being able to transverse time. So yeah. this, the next chapter, can be something where they have to go back. Edge of Yesterday. Dawn of Yesterday. Yes. <laughs> All Pre yesterday. Is yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Dawn of yesterday, never go back. I the like exciting that. thing, though, is him saying that the script of this one is, quote unquote, much better than the original, which is tough to do because right. the last one was pretty damn good. All right, what's next? In an interview about their latest horror sequel, Ouija Origin of Evil, Collider Steve Frosty Weintraub asked producers Andrew Form and Brad Fuller about their thoughts on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows and whether or not the box office was enough to warrant a third film in the franchise. Form said, I don't think there's Turtles 3, but I wouldn't say there's never going to be another Turtles movie. Shanette Byers sell a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 ever happening. Well, kids, you know, I like <laughs> shapes, right? I like to play Tetris. I didn't see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because they were like fighting weird spaceships that were coming from other dimensions. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not really that bummed out about this news. <laughs> what, what, what does that have to do with shapes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The spaceship's coming down. I just saw you remove part yeah. of your costume. Hang on a sec. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kids want to come in my van and play with shapes? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. 
I don't have a van. You can come, come along. What do you think, out. Mark? Oh, John, unfortunately, I don't know what we do with this franchise right now because there, I've seen so much potential in both of the first two Ninja Turtles movies. Neither one of them were great films, but there was that elevator scene in the first one, and there was the van scene in the second one where I'm like, it, it, can we just make that a movie? But it just seems like we're never going to get the Turtles movie that we want with these new incarnations. We just want a movie with the Turtles, kick most of the humans out. You can keep Casey Jones. Kick everybody else out and just have the Turtles fight Shredder or Krang and they just will not give that movie to us. So I can't be that upset about it. So I will, I'll buy that we're not going to see a Ninja Turtles 3. I, it, it's a bummer, but maybe we get a new rebooted one 10 years down the road and I can celebrate that one. Yeah, I unfortunately I have to buy this because look, we, we this is well documented. Schneff and I both. I was expecting nothing out of that 2014 mm -hmm. one, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm not gonna say I loved the first, but I really enjoyed it. it. Was shocked the hell out of me that I enjoyed it so much. Made almost 500 million dollars worldwide. Second one comes out, major step backwards to me. I did not enjoy it at all, and it went from 500, almost 500 million at the box office, to under 250 million. I dropped in half. Mm. It actually lost money for the studio. That kind of trajectory, you cannot go back now and make number three and expect the fans to turn out and trust you and come out and see it in droves. So unfortunately, I was looking forward after the first one to seeing three or four of these Ninja Turtle movies. Now it's time to pull the plug. And like you said, Mark, probably, maybe come back and try rebooting it again in another five years or so. I mean, it, it ain't going anywhere as far as the lore and the love of Ninja Turtles that yeah. people have. It's just a matter of if you can pull it off well on a big scale movie. And they just haven't done it consistently enough in these first two movies. Great. All right. What's next? According to a report from Deadline, Harry Potter producer David Heyman's biblical epic Methuselah is moving forward at Warner Brothers with Tom Cruise and director Joachim Roning, who is fresh off directing Disney's 2006. 17 summer blockbuster Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales. Cruz will play the title character who was said to live 969 years according to the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. A release date has not been set. John Byrcel, the Methuselah epic with Tom Cruise. I think if I'm going to buy this, I mean, some of the classic all time great Hollywood movies have been the old biblical epics. And in the recent years, you got some real stinkers that try to go along with that. The Russell Crowe one wasn't so bad, actually. I didn't mind the Russell Crowe one, the one about Noah and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. With, the only reason I'm going to buy this is because of who is attached. All right, you've got the right producer, you got the right director, you got the right star. Because all those things are together, that's enough to move my needle from a, from a sell on this to a buy, so I'm going to buy it. What do you think, Schnepp? I wonder, I mean, is this Tom Cruise trying to do the interview with a vampire? Like, cause it's like, is he like, Methuselah is like a guy who just lives forever, sort of like a vampire. I, I don't know how they're going to approach this. Are they going to do it biblical style or is he going to be like hanging out in a New York suite? Like I'm immortal. <laughs> I mean, it sounds interesting. I'm just going to wait and see. So I'm going to not sell or buy it. Float in the middle. Yeah, but I, on its ear, I'm, I'm a pessimistic little rodent today because I'm going to sell this one too. I just, it, it's, it, you said you had the right star at Tom Cruise. I want to see that star do different movies than a biblical epic because you're right. Biblical epics have not been great recently. If the best one that we've had is Noah, I don't think that's a high bar to pass. But I also think that it we're just maybe past the time when you can make a great biblical Hollywood movie like we did with the Ten Commandments or the original Ben Hur or something like that. I just don't care about seeing this movie. The story of Methuselah is very interesting. Tom Cruise certainly ages very well. I don't know if he ages to, you know, 960 years old or whatever the <laughs> hell Methuselah ended up being. But if you're doing Schnapp's take where you have this character of Methuselah that is walking around and is not locked down to other events in the Bible or time and period pieces in that book, then you could have something interesting on your hands. But it just feels like very, very shaky waters mm -hmm. right now. All right, guys, so listen, we do this show live, and so as we do, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of this episode to take some of your live Twitter questions. All you got to do is make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and you can start firing in those questions now, and Wendy will pick out a couple questions to ask at the end of the episode. I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later today, we have TV Talk, which drops at 5 p.m. Make sure you check that out. And speaking of TV... Episode two of our Walking Dead recap show went up last night. If you're a Walking Dead fan, make sure you go into our channel and check out episode two of our Walking Dead recap. You're going to want to check that out. And also a little bit later today, the newest installment of our Crash Course series. Crash Course looking at this whole theory that maybe Boba Fett was actually 
<laughs> Supreme Leader Snoke. What? We what? take a look at that. Impossible. Make sure you go and check that out a little bit later today. All right, guys, let's reach out part of the show now for Mailbag. If you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We got a couple questions picked out. So, Ashley, what do we got? Daniel Zuckerman writes, hey, Collider team. My name is Daniel. I'm from Mexico, and I love your show. Yesterday, I saw the trailer of the new Robert Zemeckis movie, Allied. I'm clearly engaged in it, but was totally spoiled the hell out of the plot, even though I know the trailer is there to tell you about the plot. But I was wondering if you think that going into a movie with no knowledge at all makes the experience better. Well, first of all, I, I think you're misinterpreting the trailer for, for, uh, for Ally because I don't think it gave the movie away. What I think it's set up for you is this is the setup. Like the whole thing about that they were spies together, they get married, fall in love and get married and have kids, and now it comes out that she might actually be a double spy. Mm. That's not revealing the movie. That's revealing, I believe, the setup to the movie. I believe the movie really starts at that point. That's where you get, so I believe it's probably within the first 45 minutes that you get to the point where Brad Pitt has that scene in the trailer where they're telling him, we think your wife might actually be a double agent. That's probably in the first half hour, 45 minutes of the movie, and then that's where the story starts. So I, I think we're misinterpreting the trailer on that end. As far as this notion of, you know, should we skip trailers? Should we not want to know anything about a movie before going in? That's a very romantic idea, but it's not very practical. Because, I mean, without trailers, a lot of these great movies, nobody would go see. Like, here's, here's a couple examples of movies just from this year. Let's, let's bring up the first image of that. So just this year, like, look at the Don't Breathe poster. If all that you see, you get no trailer, you don't know anything about the movie, that poster comes out, it makes $5 million, maybe, mm. opening weekend. Right. The Accountant, yes, there's some big names on it, but Ben Affleck, is like, I don't think that movie's gonna make any money whatsoever. You can't even see the guy's face. You can't even see the guy's you face. see his you, face. You don't see a trailer and you don't understand what this movie's about. Let's try the next two here. Here's a couple more. Like Queen of Conway, if that's all you see, you know nothing about that movie, you just see that poster, right. that movie doesn't break $2 million opening weekend. No. Same thing with Hell or High Water. It's like, okay, you got Jeff Bridges there, but it's not like Jeff Bridges brings out $100 million openings all the time. No one's gonna go see that movie. I wouldn't have been as interested in that movie at all had I not seen the trailer and thought, oh my God, this looks really good. So while I believe there are some circumstances where knowing nothing about a movie can increase your enjoyment of it, I like knowing, okay, what is the story about before I pick up a book? Okay, what's the general idea of the story? So I'll read the back cover. Oh, this sounds good. I'll watch it. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are some circumstances where it, but it's simply not practical. I don't know, Schnepp, what's your point of view on this? You know what? I like the uh, progression of the trailer over time. Like now we have these teaser trailers that we, we didn't really get that all the time, right. like maybe 10, 15 years ago. But now we have like a teaser trailer, which is about a minute. And those are my favorite kinds of trailers to watch because they don't get too much into the plot. Like, like take for instance, Logan. Like, I don't really know what the storyline mm -hmm. is. I know it's in the future. I know it's gonna be grim. I know it's kind of Mad Max Western style with those characters involved. I'm 100% sold on that film and I wanna see it now. And I don't need to see another trailer that goes into story details. In fact, I'd prefer not to. I probably will watch it because I'm a nerd and I have to see it, but those are the kinds of things like Arrival. I saw the first trailer. I was like, that's perfect. It's piqued my interest. Those are the kind of trailers that I like when they start to get into too much story. Remember, it's usually a 90 minute or two hour movie. I don't need to really know what the halfway point is. So for me myself, maybe the first Allied trailer really worked and the second one, I agree with you, gave away a little too much. Haven't seen the movie yet, but I kind of like it when they're a little more mysterious. Yeah, it's interesting as somebody who is a movie reviewer, so you have to go see virtually everything that comes out, whether you've seen the trailer for it or not. I've gotten lucky a couple times, and I do enjoy occasionally when it's a movie that I'm not circling on my calendar months and months ahead of time. I got to see a movie called Puncture that has Chris Evans in it a couple years ago. Really good movie, loved it. Had no idea what it was about going in. Same thing with Manchester by the Sea, which is an upcoming movie. I had not seen a trailer for it. All I knew was that Casey Affleck's in it, and that's it. It's fun to see a movie with just eyes, like naked virgin eyes, where you have no idea what's happening. But I'll also say this, is that if it's a movie that's coming out that you're excited about, I look at trailers and I get excited for the actual trailer. I don't even think about the movie just yet. I love watching a trailer and being like, what was that? Who was that? Like these Star Wars trailers? Sometimes the Star Wars trailers are better than the actual movies. Look at the prequels. I loved every one of those trailers. The movies might've let me down a little bit, but I got excited to Transformers see the Transformers trailers. trailers. The Transformers trailers are always yeah. good. So sometimes trailers are fun just as little two minute pieces of art in their own right. So don't sell them short in that regard either. 
And think about like how many people were buzzing and excited to see Logan before that trailer came out. Not mm -hmm. many. Not not a ton. <laughs> and now how many of us are excited a to lot. see Logan? Like almost all of us. All right. What's the next mailbag question? King of Wakanda writes, Hey Collider, hope you guys are having a great start to your week. Since it's Halloween today, my question is simple. What are some of the scariest movie scenes you've ever seen? Oh, scariest movie scenes. That's a tough one. Like for me, like just my favorite horror movies, my favorite scary movies of all time. You guys have heard me say this before. All time, it's the original American Werewolf in London. Mm. That I still can't watch that movie at night with the lights off. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because I watched it when I was really young, and so it's implanted in my brain. It just scares the hell out of me. And the other one is The Descent. The more modern one is The Descent. That movie, that movie freaks me out before anything supernatural happens. Right. Before anything out of the ordinary happens, These that movie. People are crazy. I am already freaked. <laughs> why the are they hell crawling out. inside those little like cubby hole cave? You oh know, that's my god, that movie freaks me out. He's saying yeah. they're crazy, and this is a guy dressed as a clown who loves Tetris. That's right. <laughs> He's afraid of him. Yeah, I would be very afraid to watch the. But the individual again. scenes. That's what I'd have to think. Of. I don't know. What about you, Mark? What's some number one? What's some of your favorite movies? But what are some of your favorite more scary scenes? I got some real nice bombastic ones with a lot of like effects and music and swirling and you know papers flying everywhere because clearly Satan's involved. That would be the exorcist when she actually starts to levitate off the bed and you see the little like flashes of the demon itself you see oh, that yeah. statue that that the the character starts worshiping it's really really intense stuff the one that always got me as a kid and as an adult is the pet cemetery flashbacks to zelda the sister who doesn't really figure into the plot we're telling but there's just this memory of the sister zelda and it's still to this day horrifies the crap out of me. Obviously, The Nun from Nightmare on Elm Street 3 has a very, very personal connection with a kid who went to Catholic school. But maybe the one <laughs> that actually scares me the most is the simplest of setups, no special effects required at all. It's just somebody sitting on a couch, and then there's a room in the back, and then you see a guy with a bag over his head and the strangers just go, Oh. <laughs> and it's like, what the hell was yeah, that the strangers guy? Had Horrifying stuff, really well done, Chuck. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, a lot of those horror dream sequences were really frightening when I saw it when I was a lot younger. But the one that stands out to me the most is the blood test in The Thing, the original John, the sequel, or the, pre, the remake, the John Carpenter's The Thing, where McReady's like, he has everybody tied on a couch and he's doing blood tests for each one of them. And, he, and we get down to the last three and he's like he's talking to the one doctor. He, I always knew it was you. That's why I saved you for last. And then he does it to this one, the one guy you didn't think it was. Mm -hmm. And he, he is the thing. The blood shoots up, starts yeah. running away. And he turns into this weird creature and flips up onto the, onto the, the roof of the, it just, it, it goes crazy. The whole scene goes crazy. All these people tied to the couch, screaming. That's one of my favorite scenes. Some of the original, some of the scenes in the original Jaws mm. still haunt me. Mm -hmm. But there's a there's a movie that came out like a little over a year ago, or just the last year. It's not even anything you see, but I don't know why. It is for as far as single scenes go, it comes from The Witch. That and there's this last one is you don't even see anything, and mm. it freaked the hell out of yep. me. There's this girl, and she's talking to a goat, just yes. the family goat, and the goat's off camera. You don't even see it, and you, she kind of complains out of her second, and then all of a sudden you hear this voice, "What dost thou want?" Freaked the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. I, you don't even see the goat; you just hear the voice, Black and it just Phillip. shook me. Totally shook me. Usually family goats don't act like that. Jim. No, That's no, right. it's hey, not. It's the family thing. goat, you know? It's, you come home from school, hey, let me pet the family goat. It's the pet. Wendy, what about you? Do you got any, like, favorite horror movies or favorite scenes that really, really scared you? I have two. I have one from The Exorcist. Not the one where she's spider walking down the stairs, but that that's scary, too. But when she was in the room with the crucifix, the really grotesque scene. Oh, where she's, yeah. Yeah. And when her head spun, and when yeah. I saw that, I was like, never again am I watching this movie. <laughs> and I haven't watched it since. Uh, and then the other ones from Strangers, when uh, Liz Taylor was in the kitchen by herself, there was no sound, and the guy with the bag comes in to the kitchen and just kind of like hangs out in the background, and there was just no sound. It really creeped me out. Mm -hmm. Ashley, what about you? Um, last night I was watching Silence of the Lambs for the first time in a really long time, and there's this scene where she visits the prison for the first time, and she gets a little surprise on her face. I wouldn't necessarily say that that was scary, but it like really took me aback. Also, um, Blair Witch Project. I'm a huge horror fan, and I think I saw that at the wrong age or something because that movie scared me so much. The final scene freaked me out. I think I actually cried. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. Hey, here's my reenactment of the thing. <laughs> Wait, the clown is turning into John Schnapp. The clown is melting! Melting! Yeah. Yeah. 
the go. world. <laughs> All right, we said we'd take some time to take your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Evan, who writes, what did you guys think of the live trailer with Jake Gyllenhaal and Ryan Reynolds? Yeah, you know, we probably should talk. I don't want to go too much into it because we'll probably talk about it more in mm. depth tomorrow. I really liked it. I, I knew very little about the film. The trailer uh, came and it hooked me. And that's the job of trailers. So I really liked it. Yeah, for me, I, you know, I'm in the middle somewhere. Like we were just talking about trailers where like they give away too much or they don't show too much or they just, they're there to pique your interest. It kind of piqued my interest mainly because of the cast. Like Jake Gyllenhaal, Ryan Reynolds, uh, Ferguson, uh, and then it was like, okay, there's an alien. It's some or what? Then you see satellites mi malfunctioning. You're like, what kind of movie is this? So I didn't really get a vibe other than it's it's obviously maybe some kind of science fiction space horror film. Or I didn't really understand fully what the whole film's about. I'm interested to see it, but that's a movie now that I need to actually see a second trailer on. So after having seen half the trailer right before a movie talk, I'm locked in. Can't wait to continue <laughs> the Odyssey and watch the second half of the trailer. There's a whole lot of handsome on that spaceship. All right, what's next? Calvin Duncan writes, if Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles gets rebooted, who would you want to take the reins? Mm. Oh gosh, it's it's one just a good director. I mean, really, it's just it's somebody who's good and tells a good story. Really, I, I don't have any look. Once now that we're in an age where the Russo brothers from what How I Met Your Mother, oh my God, it's, it's, it's Michael Myers. I haven't heard him come. I heard him come walking in. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. oh Negan is here. Don't worry. Oh my God. Did everybody get the forty time on Negan? It's a, yeah. it's a fast run through camera. That was a very fast. Sign that guy to a contract. Yeah. I can't even remember what we were talking about. We were talking about who's going to be directing the oh, Ninja Turtles yeah, movie. Like, we're going to have in fifteen an era years now, where like directors from like sitcom directors are coming in and directing Captain America, like Civil War. Right. We got Peyton Reed coming in and doing Ant. Guys, I got an idea. Let's start a petition to get Quinn Tarantino to direct. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 scrambles. Oh, man. I'll go with uh, Matt Reeves. He seems to be pretty good at the uh, performance motion capture kind of stuff. So yeah. we're going to need that going he forward. He would qualify. That's right. Get Andy Serkis in his splinter. And make him <laughs> they turn the splinter into a chipmunk. That's what I want to see. Yes. <laughs> All right. What's next? Uh, Mr. Robert Young writes, I'm staying in tonight. What Halloween movie can you recommend? Maybe ones that aren't the most obvious ones. Well, we know where you're going to be, Mr. Robert Young, tonight. <laughs> 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 We're totally coming to your house later, yeah. dude. <laughs> Hang out. Um, a good, but, but, like, aside from pure horror, what's a good Halloween movie? Uh, oh, you mean like, like like one that's off the beaten path? I mean, like, if you want... That, act, that actually is centered around the, the holiday of Halloween. Oh, mm. what, like it's about Halloween. Yeah. So, Trick or treat. Yeah, trick or treat. Trick or treat is the yeah, one. Yeah. 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 Trick or treat there you pretty go. Good. Treat yourself to trick or treat. All right, what's next? Oh, whoops. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Adrian M. Soto writes... Favorite candy and least favorite candy, keeping in theme with Halloween. It's not necessarily a candy for me. It's the house that gives you uh, a toothbrush <laughs> <laughs> or uh, pennies. Wow. Oh, yeah. Get like yeah. 20 pennies yep. from this yep. lady one time. Pennies, and I'm like, yeah. what are you favorite doing? Favorite candy is uh, yeah. when they give you an entire apple. Screw that. Uh, Reese's Cups. I don't like the candy corn. Oh. I, uh, I think Snickers, a fun size Snickers. Yes. Snickers is the greatest candy of all time. There's not even an argument about it. It's got everything you want, nothing you don't. You got your peanuts, your caramel, some nougat, milk chocolate coating. Snickers is the all time greatest candy. If you go trick or treating in rich neighborhoods, you might walk mm. into a fun size or maybe even a king size Snickers. What I wow. I hated looking in my bag and seeing little boxes of raisins. Mm. Yeah. It's like, what oh, kind yeah. of bullshit is yeah. this? Did you fruit? give them to your dad? I would give those raisins to my dad. He would get the mounds candy bars, anything coconutty or yeah. raisins. But my, yeah, my dad wouldn't accept raisins. He'd be really? like, you keep the raisins, give ah. me the Snickers. The, oh, I'm, I'm the Reese's peanut butter cups. Yeah. My number one favorite thing. Really? Mark, there. Mark oh, Ellis yeah. loses. We both went with Reese's. I feel like Bam. peanut butter is delicious. It's just kind of a niche candy, whereas Snickers has something for. We have peanuts and Snickers. Just because it's not the butter, you need no, everything no, no. sugar coated. No. Peanut butter is better it's than peanut peanuts. butter beats. Snickers. You don't get peanut butter without a peanut. That's that just does not make yeah. any sense. You got to actually process. It's a process. I love part. tomato sauce, yeah. but I don't eat tomatoes. Yeah, it's so a totally different they situation. Taste totally How different. How dare you bring tomatoes into this <laughs> candy? <laughs> yeah. All right. What's next? <laughs> All right, Jonathan Peck writes, what are two what are two horror directors you want to see working together? My picks are Tim Burton and Sam Raimi. Oh, that's a, that'd be an interesting combo. Uh, I would love, just because of the whole Evil Dead thing, I would love to see uh, Sam Raimi and Fede. 
working uh, Fede mm. t- working together. I think seeing them do something together would be really fun. I say Stuart Gordon and John Carpenter. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that'd be pretty good too. I would say uh, David Sandberg's a guy who has a lot of talent. I like the way that he composes shots. And when you put him with somebody who's a little more, say, visual flair oriented, like a Scott Derrickson, I think that would be an interesting combo. And I believe they have both worked with James Wan's production company already. So maybe that marriage could in fact happen. Eli Roth and Dario Argento. Oh, that would be cool. All right, two more. Okay, this one comes from Benoit Bowflex, who writes, Who is everyone's director wish list for a future Star Wars? Mine are Zack Snyder and Matt Reeves. No, it's, oh, until he finally does it, Steven Spielberg. Steven mm. Spielberg, he is he's destined to do a Star Wars film. He should do a Star Wars film. I know he says he won't, but I'm, I'm not going to give up hope until it happens. He's like, everybody else is great. Everybody else is great. But it's, it's Steven Spielberg has to do one. Uh, the Ava DuVernay call that we had a couple weeks ago I think was an interesting one. I think she could bring a new story element to Star Wars. John Favreau is a guy I think has a lot of talent in the realm of uh, Star Wars, but I'll be honest with you. I think, who makes great war movies? Catherine Bigelow. Sure. You got your Zero Dark Thirty, yeah. you got your Hurt Locker. Great action in something like the greatest action movie of the 90s, Point Break. I want to see what she could do in a galaxy far, far away. So there'd be a lot of great action and some real intensity. Yeah, I would go with starting a petition for Quentin Tarantino. Ah, no, I'm just kidding. Off <laughs> All right, last question of the day. Oh, no, I lost it. I lost it. Oh, uh, no, oh, here it is. Oh, found it. Oh. Found it. I found you, Lonnie. Lonnie Magic. Jones writes, if you could live in any horror movie universe, what one would you choose? <laughs> Ooh. Damn. Let's, let's say not if you got to live with, if you had to live in one. I, I, I think we're going with the conception that we want to be able to survive the longest. So we're kind of looking at this like the Hunger Games. Like, like, like which horror movie universe do we either assume? Do we, we like could? our chances? Which one do we like our chances? We like our chances in? or the, the death would be like quick and painless. All right. So I've got mine. Halloween Town from the Nightmare Before Christmas. I'm living there because it's fun. I saw uh, Danny it. Elfman in the Hollywood Bowl yeah. on uh, Friday. Oh, yeah. He composed it, or he didn't actually compose. He sang the role of Jack Skellington with the entire movie. Paul Rubens was there, Catherine O'Hara. Awesome time. That's not my pick. Which my is pick, your pick? <laughs> Friday the 13th, because I, I think I can outrun Jason. <laughs> like these morons, these stupid kids <laughs> in the middle of nowhere in Camp Crystal Lake, I can outrun all of them. And what do they always say in situations like this? You don't have to be the fastest person, you just can't be the slowest. I can definitely dust at least one of those idiot campers and I'm never getting killed. I'm saying it right now. I will never get killed in a Friday the 13th Hang universe. Hang on a second, Alice. You have to sleep and Jason doesn't. Uh, yeah, but I can. Yeah, I, but as long as you don't sleep with a teenage virgin, he generally <laughs> not, leaves not, you alone. Right. Those are the guys he goes yeah. after. And I don't sleep with a lot of virgins, John. <laughs> so pretty. No you're, you're pretty. By the way, speaking of horror <laughs> universes, you've heard us recommend this movie before, but there's a movie that lives within, that pretends it lives within the actual horror universes of Halloween, of, of uh, the Friday the 13th, of um, Nightmare on Elm Street. It's called uh, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Mm-hmm. If you have Ooh. not seen this movie... It is not only a great deconstruction of the horror genre, it is funny as hell at the same time. Remind me that when he says, you just got to outrun them. Do you remember mm-hmm. that scene? Oh, totally, talking totally. About that? And it's also a found footage type. It's like a documentary is what it is. It switches yeah. gears. Yeah. So it's, it's like half documentary. And then about after the second act, it switches yes. gears into a feature film yeah. style. Mm-hmm. And it's really great fun. Film. Great fun. That's another check Halloween film that you should see. You should rent that tonight. Yes, go check it. You know what? That's a great one. If you're staying in tonight, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Check that out. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment, this special Halloween edition of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, it's Tetris Clown. John Schnepp, where can people find you? You can find me haunting some people later today. It's Halloween, uh, and you can find me on Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter, just at John Schnepp. Over here, unemployed chef, where can people find you, Mark I Ellis? am Dale. Dale, <laughs> sorry. You can find me at Dale the Squirrel or at Mark <laughs> Ellis Live on Twitter, and I will be at the Comedy Store in Hollywood this weekend. Wonder Woman number one, Ashley Mova. Where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Ashley Mova. Happy Halloween, guys. <laughs> and Wonder Woman number two, Wendy Lee. Where can people find you? On Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram, at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ for John Schnapps and Mind Show. Film HQ, new episodes every Saturday. Thank you to everybody for watching. Make sure you join in the conversation in the comment section below. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks for joining us, and until next time. Happy Halloween. (laughs) If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. 
Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.